<clears throat> so I real quickly whipped through this, but if we look kind of historically at the periodic table, it built slowly just because we hadn't purified all the elements yet. And so that was one of the kind of issues behind the organization system is the organizations we had just weren't fully developed. So it started with triads, right? and the triads was important ultimately because we could tie that back to something we were already accepting as all important, and triads with religion. Right? So we get lots of kind of numerology showing up and saying, oh, well, all elements must be arranged in triads because that then ties to what we know already in these other systems. Right, or how we describe these other systems. As we developed and found more and more elements, we found that the triad system didn't work very well. Right? And that's where Newlands came in when we had 62 known elements and noted that they were roughly arranged by groups of seven. Right? So we started to see a repeat in the kind of knowledge or the chemistry of those individual atoms or elements every seven elements. We saw kind of a cycling. Right? That was the law of octaves. If you know anything about music, that makes sense to you. If you don't know anything about music, don't worry about it. Right? But it's the law of octaves. Okay? <clears throat> that pretty much sets us up for Mendeleev. Mendeleev came in, or Mendeleev came in, and organize what he had, and he organized it according to increasing atomic mass, okay, which isn't all that big of a deal, because if we go back and look at Newlands, Newlands did the same thing according to atomic mass. So why is Mendeleev now like the one everybody now acknowledges is this big famous guy that is the father of the periodic table? Okay? Well, <clears throat> he arranged with our columns and the individual rows, but the part that kind of made him stand out above everybody else, is that in his organization, he said, there's an empty hole here. There's an element there. Okay. Everywhere you see Eka, uh, which in this one is just those three, was him saying, we don't have an element to fit there. There needs to be an element to fit there. You haven't found it yet. Okay. That's pretty kind of mind-boggling. The organization, what he saw within the patterns, allowed him to say, hey, you just haven't found the correct science yet. Go find it. Okay? Which also made him sound kind of crazy. Right? Because we've got all these things, and, you, and you're now telling me back here, I've got all the way down to tellurium down here, and you're telling me that I'm missing something here? That doesn't make any sense. Okay? Why would I be missing something? Okay? Shouldn't it be easier to find that element? Right? And that's kind of the crazy part of what he did, is he was able to go through and say that something is missing here. Now he was able to say something is missing here, he was able to tell people what the properties of that something was. It should have this color. It should weigh this much. Right? It should have this density. It should conduct electricity. So he could predict all of these properties without ever having access to the material because of the organization of his periodic table. It is that predictive ability that he's really known for. Right? And if we consider kind of the levels behind that, let's see. Okay. 1869, he comes through and says, there's something. Okay. Eka means similar. So similar to silicon. He says something similar to silicon needs to exist. You just haven't found it yet. I think it's gray. It weighs 72 units. It has a density of 50, or sorry, 5.5 grams per milliliter. Melting point is really high. You can quantify it. When it reacts with oxygen, it has the formula EK for ECA. He didn't have a symbol for it. He didn't know what the element was. O2, the density, okay, the formula when it reacts with chlorine, and the boiling point of the chloride. <coughs> Those are predictions, straight up guesses. 20 years later, so that's like I tell you 20 years from now, this is the job you're going to have. This is the money you're going to be making. This is the city and state that you're going to be living in. And you're going to think I'm crazy. What happened with his predictions? Feel free to just compare those numbers roughly. It 
that that looks pretty on point. All right. So yeah, I may predict your future and you're going to consider me crazy, but then in 20 years, if I'm right, I'm now an amazing genius. And now you're going to be telling everybody, oh, my chem instructor back in college, that guy was a genius because he predicted my future. I become famous. That's why Mendeleev is famous. It's because of this very good organization of his system allowed him to predict those properties. That's huge. Okay. And we'll look at that, but that's the biggest deal here. Once it was discovered, it became its own, it got its own name, germanium. Why is it called germanium? German scientists that discovered it. Okay. So it was given the name germanium. Okay. So that predictive power, that's what makes Mendeleev cool. That's what gives us the periodic table pretty much as we know it today. Right, there's some big changes behind it. Um, he organized according to atomic mass. Ours isn't organized according to atomic mass. It's organized according to atomic number, the upper right-hand corner. And if you go through and compare element by element, it's pretty darn close. Atomic number and atomic mass correlate very, very strongly. There are a few exceptions, however, and so if we had organized by atomic mass, we'd have some oddities going on, like iodide and tellurium would be switched, okay? because the atomic mass doesn't continue to increase. Everybody see that? But the chemical properties of iodine better match bromine and chlorine than they do selenium and sulfur. Okay? They better match because the atomic number is a better signifier of their chemistry. Okay? Those differences tend to fall fairly low in the periodic table, which means their abundance also tends to be fairly low, which means they weren't quite as discovered, which makes it more difficult to come up with those predictions. Okay? Um, another thing that we can kind of add to this we think back to the dates. This is 1869, he's making predictions. They found the element in 1886. Okay, we can weigh things, okay, we can do that. But can you determine the mass of a proton? How small is a proton? Really, really big? No, insanely tiny. Okay, protons are very, 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 very small mass. It is so small that we can't weigh it, we can't count protons. We just kind of approximate ish. Okay. When was the discovery of the proton and electron made? I'm going to think back, uh, back to the history. Who discovered the electron? Rutherford, that did like the tin foil Rutherford with the gold foil, gold foil gave us the nucleus. Okay. But before we have the nucleus, we have to say that elements are subdivided into parts, that they have smaller pieces that contribute to an atomic mass. When did we say they had those smaller parts? It's before Rutherford. Rutherford was 1911. It was Thompson in about 1900. 1900, 1869. Right? These discoveries were made before we even knew there was a nucleus, before we even knew there were things smaller than atoms. And he was able to predict the existence of new atoms. Okay. It's pretty phenomenal what they were able to actually do without having a basic understanding of what makes these things. Okay. Again, more power to why they were super cool when they did these discoveries. Okay. As we continue to discover more, one of the last things we discovered were the noble gases <clears throat> and nuclear charge. Nuclear charge was a late thing, or late discovery because, well, to determine the nuclear charge, you have to know there's a nucleus. That's why that's going to be a late discovery, because that was 1900s. Okay. The noble gases added an extra row okay, in about 1894, and that's when they first got argon. Why were those so late in the discovery? Okay. How many of you in here are part of the nobility? You're laughing at me. Why, why are you laughing at that statement? What do you associate with being part of the nobility? Royal 
Okay, royal blood, kings, cool. They still got to get an education. Why don't you think nobility is going to be taking a class here? They're rare. Okay, they're rare. This school is one of millions. That's pretty rare. <coughs> what do you mean prestige? What would give prestige? Name by itself. Okay, the name. Where did the name come from to gain that prestige? Uh, it's history. It's okay, we could potentially look at history. Name some prestigious people that you're aware of. Is any kind of any time. Okay, Hawking, prestigious. Why is he prestigious? Uh, he's Intelligence. Okay. Name somebody else that you might say is prestigious. <clears throat> Mayweather. Why is Mayweather prestigious? Okay. He's the best at knocking people out. Okay. He's not intelligent, though. But he's good at what he does. Okay. But he's good at what he does. Okay, that works. Donald Trump. Why is Donald Trump prestigious? He's president. How do you get to be president? Let's kind of avoid some of the politics a little bit. I know I opened up a can there, but... He's rich and he has rich parents. He's what? He's rich and he He's has rich. rich parents. What does Mayweather have a lot of? Money. What does Hawking have a lot of? Money. Okay. If we go through and search through our nobilities, Nearly everybody that is noble, that is considered prestigious, has money. Why do we expect to not see any nobility in this classroom? Because we're all broke. <laughs> we're all broke. Okay. The nobility is going to pay someone to individually teach them because they have the money where they don't have to sit in a classroom and potentially interact with the lesser people. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome, isn't it? Okay. Why do we call the noble gases noble? They don't interact with the other elements. The other elements are more readily and easily able to be discovered because they interact a little bit more. Right? Because they interact with other elements, we can see that interaction. Okay? Well, gold doesn't interact with a lot of things. And we had gold really early on. What makes gold different than the noble gases? The solid phase. It's a solid phase. I can see that solid. I can grab a hold of it. I can see that it doesn't interact with anything, but I can still see it. Can I see gases? No. Okay. So not only are they a gas, but then they don't interact with anything. Oxygen we could identify very quickly as a gas because oxygen reacts with a lot of stuff. That's why we live. Because if we get rid of that gas, we die. Okay? So we can identify that there's some invisible thing that takes care of us or allows us to exist. The noble gases, we get rid of them, what happens? Nothing. Okay? They don't affect our life. Okay? And because of that, that becomes very difficult to monitor their existence or to discover them. So they're in a phase that's very difficult, and because they don't interact with things, they're noble, they become very difficult to track. Okay? If it never interacts, it becomes very difficult to identify it exists. Okay? So it took very careful experimentation to discover the noble gases, but they did eventually discover them. Okay? And then we get Mosley with our nuclear charge and all that kind of fun stuff. <clears throat> Mosley said, okay, if we've got this nuclear charge, then actually it makes better sense, because tellurium and iodine don't match up, to organize by atomic number, not atomic mass. Okay? And that's where we get the periodic law concept. Our periodic table is now organized according to atomic number. Okay? Yes, Mendeleev was super powerful in his predictive abilities, but he wasn't perfect. 
And it turns out, just as often as he predicted new elements, he predicted new elements incorrectly as well. Okay? But those failures are swept under the rug and ignored. Okay? So, <clears throat> the next big kind of concept that comes out of this, this second half of chapter 4, which is the hard one, which we'll get back to, Niels Bohr helps kind of solidify how we organize the periodic table into the current version we see when we add in our concept of where the electrons exist. Okay, so what we see on our periodic table, if we look back at, oh, wow, it's way back there. In this, we don't really see, it's just a rectangle with elements filled out. Okay, that's really our atomic numbers. Okay, we do get an organization, we can still predict elements. But notice we don't get the shape of our current periodic table with two columns, nice and tall, ten columns kind of in the middle, six columns kind of nice and tall. We don't get that organization until we really bring in the idea of where electrons exist. Okay? Which is kind of neat. The electrons help dictate our shape of the periodic table. So there's information about our electrons stashed in the periodic table. Kind of make sense? Okay. Good. So let's make it a quiz. Okay. That's too many letters. Nitrogen, sodium, bromine, followed by nickel, silver, potassium. Okay. Those are all important ones that you need to remember. Make sure you get those nailed down. And then question seven, explain in your opinion the most important step of the scientific method. Okay, let's switch this. Explain, in Mike's opinion, what is the most important step of the scientific method? Uh, failure. failure. It's all about failure. Okay. You need to be able to fail to learn. Okay. If you didn't fail in your experiment, then you didn't learn because you already knew what the answer was going to be. That's not learning. Okay, you need to fail to then adjust to be able to learn. That's how it works. But if you never had a hypothesis, you'd never be able to fail. <laughs> we can all have different arguments behind it. That's true. Okay. But in my opinion, absolutely the most important is failure. Okay. And that's often the one, in fact, I think that's the one that is completely ignored in all science books. Okay. Science progressives because of failure. Okay because we have a crap hy hypothesis. That was a failed hypothesis. Okay? We have to adjust and readjust and make our hypothesis better. Okay? And that's a failure initiative all the way through. Okay? Within our periodic table, we've got some kind of names that come out of this. So vertical column, Okay. vertical means up, down, for those of you who don't know. Yes, it took me a really long time to learn that, so don't panic. Verticals on that up-down axis. I still get it backwards every so often. Uh, <clears throat> the vertical column is sometimes known as the group or the family. Okay? The family is probably more important. Okay? Family is at least descriptive of it. Okay? What could you say about, well, and everybody's family is potentially different, okay? but in general, okay, if you have a brother or sister or parent or other you know, family members, you would probably go to defend them, right? You're going to help them out more than some random stranger. A okay? random stranger tied to a railroad track versus your family, you will probably divert the train to run over the stranger, not your family, okay? In theory, okay? Let's just be ideal worlds, okay? You know something about, you know something about them, so that's why you're going to divert the train. Um, <clears throat> you want to protect them, okay? You knew what they were. You knew how they acted. You probably, whether you accept it or not, also act like that. Okay? You've learned traits from your family members. Okay? Same thing happens with elements. Fluorine is in the same family as chlorine. They react very similarly. Okay? Why they react similarly is the next thing, and we will get to that. Okay? But within a family, everything reacts very, very similarly. There's nice trends behind that. Okay? And is that trend information that's useful that we can deal with? Okay? That's within our vertical column. 
the horizontal row, so now left to right, yeah, that works, left to right, on our periodic table is known as a period or sometimes a series. Period is the more common term that comes out of that. Okay. Within that period, the properties of the individual elements change a lot. Okay. We just want to be able to label that as a period. So we can't really say a whole lot about what's happening okay, or saying that because magnesium is in the same period as sodium that they have similar chemical properties. That's not true. Okay. We just know that they're in the same period. It allows me to now graphically kind of point out individual locations. So if I say uh, group 13, period 5, you could all tell me, I forgot what I said, group 13, right, period 5, you would then tell me I'm referencing I N, so group 13, it's okay, group 13, period 5, where do those two lines intersect? At I N, okay, and that was kind of funny, everybody was like, I N, uh, because you didn't know what I N stood for, that's okay, okay what does I N stand for? The hint in... Indium. Okay. Not a requirement, but that's what it is. It's indium. Okay. So by referencing those columns in rows, we can kind of zero in on an individual element. That is useful for us. It can help us label systems. Okay. So treat the periodic table as a coordinate system that allows you to zero in on individual elements, and that will help when we go through to look at electron configurations in a little bit. Okay. The next kind of thing for names that pop up every so often is several families or groups or vertical columns have names associated with them. The reason they have names associated with them is because they're old. Okay? Their discoveries were made a long time ago, and so someone was able to name that family of elements. Okay? That's the primary reason behind those, those names. Okay? Of those, unfortunately, you should actually memorize some. Group 1 and 2, and group 17 and 18. Where do we find the group information? How do I know I'm talking about group 18? You look at the vertical column label. So at the top of our columns, on our periodic table, it tells us the number. That is our group number. So group number 18 starts with helium. Anything in that column is referenced as a noble gas. Right? Anything in column 17, starting with fluorine, is known as a halogen. If we go to group 2 and group 1, group 1 is known as the alkali metals. Right? Notice there's only one word in addition to metals. In group 2, they're known as the alkaline earth metals. There are Two words in addition to metals. So group two, two words. Group one, one word. Alkali, alkaline earth. Okay. I still have trouble memorizing that too. Okay. But you're officially responsible for it. The other two on there that you aren't required to memorize, I just think they're fun to say, are the group 15 and group 16. And with a little bit of congestion, it's probably going to make this even more fun. Group 15 with our nitrogens are the nictogens, because it's a silent P, it's just kind of fun. Group 16 with the oxygen is our chalcogens. Okay. I just think it's fun to say. That's why they're on there. Okay. You will never be tested on those. You may see those pop up as just random words. You now have a trivia answer. Yay, trivia. Okay. So periodic trends. This is our power of Mendeleev. And it's going to contribute to our power of science okay? and learning from observations that we can make. Okay? So we're given a bunch of information up there. Okay? Given that information, I want to know a reasonable density for potassium. Okay? That should already strike you as kind of an odd question because if we look at the elements, what information are you given about the elements? 
Just in that first column, what information are you given? Just the symbols, okay? But what am I giving you in the question? The name, okay? So your first order of business is to convert the name to the symbol so that we can make a comparison. So what is the symbol for potassium? Okay. That is now K. We now need to figure out the relationship between K and all the given information. Right? So some people are already shifting and looking at the periodic table. That's a good idea. Right? Where do we see lithium, sodium, rubidium, and cesium? They're all in the group one column. Right? So we're all talking about group one column which means we could see some trends within that column because they're in the same family. Where is potassium with respect to that column? Fourth the fourth one. You mean it's in the same column? Yes. That's what allows me to draw conclusions about it. Okay? In fact, it is right where that giant gray bar is on the slide. Okay? So I want to know something about a reasonable density for potassium. So is a reasonable density going to be 50? Why not? Because if I go through and look, that goes up by, you know, 20-ish, a little bit less than 20. This one goes up by almost 50. So between those two, or between in here and here, I should be going up by at least 20, maybe even 30. So that says 50. Yeah, but you asked for density, not atomic mass. Okay. Make sure you answer the question that was asked. The question that was asked was? Density. density. So yes, 50 is a phenomenal answer if we were asked about atomic mass, but we aren't. We're asked about the density. So we take a look at our density columns, and we see... Think about it for a second. Come up with what you think might be a reasonable density for potassium. And never mind that I just erased something. Okay. Everybody got a decent guess? What you think is a reasonable guess? Okay, let me start firing out some numbers. 0.4. No. Why not? If we look at our densities, what happens is we move down the column. They go, up. they go up. So if I do 0.4, I'm lower than that for lithium. Since potassium is higher up, it should be higher than that for lithium. 0.6. Why not? It should be greater than that for sodium because, again, the trend. Okay. So let's go 1.6. That's greater than sodium, but that's more than rubidium, and that doesn't make sense. So what's a number that makes sense? Whoa. That would be the eraser. So I heard 1.15, 1 1.2. Okay. I would argue those are all decent guesses based off the data we have, even the 1.3 that was shouted out. So on a test, we may see it written in this way. <coughs> Given the above information, what is a reasonable density for potassium? B. And our answer is B. Okay. So now a question is D. Is it impossible to use the data to come to a conclusion? No. Okay. So D is there just as kind of a red herring to really test do you actually have no clue what you're doing? You now have two options to choose from, okay? Where your potential, or technically four, you could be saying impossible to tell. Well, I just never learned that, so it must be impossible, okay? That's why that answer is there, okay? Since you've learned it, you should recognize that a reasonable answer for this is B, okay? That would be a solid hypothesis. So let's slowly start to add some more information into this. Notice that as I kind of cleared away all that writing, we see a footnote jump up. 
What does that footnote say? The density for potassium is actually slightly less than that for sodium, which means our answer B is still correct. Why is it still correct? Given the above information. If I'm working with the context of information I have, the trend says that it should go up. Okay. I don't care what the actual answer is. What I care about is making conclusions based on the observations I have. That is science. Okay. So when you go through and take other science classes and they say, well, you got the answer wrong, and you say, well, this is what my results show, please tell me how these results led to that answer. Okay. And if your instructors say, well, they don't, you go, OK. I drew a conclusion from the results of my experiment. Okay. You can then enter into an argument or a discussion, or however you want to call it, that the results from your experiment were invalid, and you need to redo the experiment. Okay. Every instructor approaches that part differently. Okay. Some just say, well, you screwed up the experiment, then that's your fault. You lose points for the experiment, but you don't lose points for your analysis. Okay. Or sometimes they just say you lose everything. Okay. That's entirely up to your individual instructor. Okay. But science is about drawing conclusions from the results that you have. If you don't trust those results, you do the experiment again. Okay. That's the repetition and the power of science. It's not, here's a result, so now I'm going to make some broad sweeping conclusion. That doesn't work. That's not science. Okay. Science is doing repeatable experiments and drawing conclusions from the data that you have. Okay. So the actual answer, for those of you dying to know, is actually 0.86. Okay. For the sake of an exam, you're supposed to analyze the data given that shows a clear trend upwards. That means your answer is B. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Draw conclusions from what you are given. Yes? Would that note be on the test? I would not provide that footnote on the test. It shouldn't have been on the slide. And it's now constantly coming up because I want it there to now open this discussion. Okay. So our conclusion was that it should have been 1.23. What happened? You threw in a curveball. We failed in our experimentation, or we failed in our answer okay, from the actual result. So what would we do? We would redesign our experiment to evaluate that value. Okay. Why is it not 1.23? Okay. That's a much harder question to answer. I have one that we don't need to answer for the sake of this class. Okay, so don't stress about that. Okay. Kind of, sort of. Threw you out on the solid ice and then broke the ice underneath you. Okay. Chemical properties. Okay. Not only are physical properties in a trend within a family, okay, but the chemical properties are identical. So if I take a look at the alkali metals, which would be which group number? The first one, because one word in addition to metals, right? Okay. Or you just memorize it, that's cool. Okay. Have the general formula, metal, two of them to one oxygen. So when I react lithium with oxygen, it takes two lithiums to react with a single oxygen. It takes two sodiums to react with a single oxygen, two potassiums to react with a single oxygen. That's what those formulas show. Okay. So within a family, they have identical chemical properties. That's pretty neat. Okay. We can use this to write an exam question in the next two minutes. See what you can come up with. Should have been recording. Yes. So kind of like what's written at the bottom of the slide. Yes, I've provided a bunch of formulas. 
Okay? If we look at the periodic table, unfortunately I don't have one on the slide that we could reference, but if we look at the periodic table, we could go through and see where they're located relative to each other okay? and see if there's anything that potentially intersects or overlaps with those elements. So I believe what Alfredo suggested was, the question could be, what is the formula for nickel with oxygen? Okay. Well, to get that information, of course, we're going to use the symbol Ni and O, but now the question is how much nickel and how much oxygen? Okay. Well, to figure out that answer, I would have to know something about the family that nickel belongs in. The family is the column. What elements are in the family for nickel? Alkaline earth is group two. That's over here. So nickel's up here. Palladium and platinum. So PD and PT. Do we see any information in red for the given information for palladium or platinum? Is B, PD, or PT? Is G, E, PD, or PT? Is C, D, PD, or PT? No. So do I have enough information in the format of this question to be able to determine the formula for nickel oxide? No, this would be an impossible to determine solve. So that's not a good one. Carbon with oxygen is CO2. What is the formula for silicon and oxygen? Let's work with the formulas that we already have up here, but you got the right idea. Okay. What do you got, Jonathan? What if you did like the questions like based on the info given above, like, yep. the, the answer better fits along with the following family up there? And so you would have question, or like um, option A is AU, B is GE, O2, C is HE. So you're saying get rid of that? Yeah. Okay. That could work. And so if we get rid of potassium and just listed those and said, okay, which best belongs with that family? We had HE. We're just going to throw that in. I already forgot everything that you told me. Uh, AU, GEO2. K2O in this case. Okay. Then we could do that. Does that actually do anything with the actual chemical formula? Okay. In this case, not really, because those formulas aren't the same, right? Okay. Here, all you're really asking is which of those elements is in the same family. Okay. So I would argue that doesn't get to the chemical properties. So maybe given the Yep. What might you predict silver oxide? What is the formula for silver oxide? So, what is the symbol for silver? Was the symbol for oxygen? So, how many silvers and how many oxygens should I have in this formula? Two silvers, one oxygen. Two silvers, one oxygen. Well, but this says two and three. Boron is in a different family than silver. So what I would do is find silver. I need to find copper or gold. I am given copper. More than likely, the formula for silver oxide is going to be Ag2N1O because silver and copper are in the same family. They have the same chemical properties. So I can give you a list of possible things and then ask about a single one. Right? You just have to go through and match where is there something similar within it. Right? And that similarity has to be the family. Right? Typically where this question gets a little bit more challenging is instead of asking for something like silver oxide, I would ask for gallium with oxygen. Why is gallium with oxygen more challenging of a question here? Okay. 
Okay. Gallium is in the same family as boron. Okay. It is across that stair step. Did I talk about the stair step mattering? No, so don't worry about that. Okay. It's one away from boron, though, so that can't possibly be true. It doesn't matter. It's in the same family. Okay. What else makes it more challenging? What's to the right of it? GE and that's listed as one of your possible formulas. Oh, because it's closer, it must match. Doesn't matter. It's not in the same row. Okay. Your chemical properties go based off of the row, not the row, right? Because the row is left to right. <laughs> it's our column. I was just seeing if you were awake. Okay. It's our column, our vertical column. Has to be in the group or family. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Periodic trends. Are there other trends that can come out of this? Okay. How about size of an individual atom? What contributes to the size of an atom? The weight. Okay. We could look at weight. Okay. And it turns out weight is not going to contribute to the size so much. Why not? What particles have weight? protons and the neutrons. And where are the protons and neutrons located? In the nucleus. So if I look at the size of an atom, you're saying it's the nucleus that's determining that. The nucleus being a marble and the size of the atom being the superdome. Is the marble contributing to the size of the atom? No. So it's not a bad concept because we're used to size and weight tying to each other. In this case, they don't. What contributes to the size? Electrons. The electrons. So what do you think would happen to the size if I add more electrons? It gets bigger. All right, so let's take a look. Hydrogen, I add more electrons. Let's say let's add two more electrons. I would become like, and I have to add two more protons at the same time, I'd become lithium, right? What happens to the size? Should it get bigger or smaller? It's bigger. It has more electrons. Let's add 54 more electrons. Become cesium. Bigger or smaller? Bigger. bigger. Guess what? You're right. Cool. We add more electrons, it gets bigger. Beryllium to boron. Okay. It's not getting bigger. Wait, what? But if I go beryllium to boron, aren't I increasing the amount of electrons? Yeah. Why does it not get bigger? Okay. There's something weird going on with our electrons. And our assumption that we're making that electrons dictate size and just more electrons means bigger says that our electrons can exist anywhere, which means the more electrons we put in, the further away they're going to get naturally on their own. Okay. Turns out that assumption is inherently false. Okay. That is the second part of chapter 4. Chapter 4 tells you that the electrons can only exist in particular locations. And it is those particular locations that are going to dictate your size. Okay? So if we look at our trends, the atomic radius will increase as we go down a group. That made sense. More electrons, it gets bigger. But as we go left to right across a period, adding more electrons, the radius decreases. That doesn't make physical sense with the assumptions we've made. That's because the assumptions we've made are wrong. Okay? So we would have to address why those are wrong. Okay? To do that, we have to understand something about where the electrons exist. So we will see these trends again, but here's a nice pretty picture of it. When we look down a column, you can clearly see that they do indeed get bigger. Left to right, they do indeed get smaller. Okay? That trend is something that you need to memorize okay? or understand where it's coming from. Okay? And that's the next kind of sequence behind this. <clears throat> if you want, you can memorize on the periodic table and you can start to draw these arrows. We will talk about these kind of arrows when it comes to the exam because you're given a periodic table on the exam. Okay? You may get confused with the trends of atomic radius. 
And so you start the exam, you're like, I totally understand atomic radius. It's easy. I'm not going to forget this. You start taking the exam. What happens to your brain power? Okay. Regardless of what you think your brain power is, it's falling. Okay. And if you think it's going to fall, it's probably falling faster than you thought it was. Okay. Which means the instant you get your exam, purge what you know onto the exam. Draw some arrows on your periodic table. You don't have to memorize it anymore. It's already on the exam. You just have to look at what you wrote down. Okay? More than likely, your brain power will be at its max at the beginning of the exam. You can write it down correctly. When you get to later in the exam and your brain is now a ball of mush, when you see a question about radius, all you have to do is remind yourself that you were brought smart at one point in your life that was probably 30 minutes ago. <coughs> and there's your answer. So write information on the exam. I fully expect and encourage you to do so. Do not keep it in your brain. Okay? So chapter four, because here's where our brains go to mush. Okay? We're looking at the wave nature of light. And so we encounter quantum physics and all sorts of other nasty stuff behind it. Okay? We can run lots of calculations. There's an, even a, a formula in the lower left-hand corner. There's the speed. Before you start copying that down, you might actually listen to what I have to say about this because I don't expect you to do any calculations with the speed of light. I don't expect you to do any calculations with energy. If you want to do it, by all means, go ahead, but I don't expect you to. What I want you to get out of the whole kind of discussion on light is what wavelength is. Wavelength is the distance between peaks. Okay? What I want you to get is your frequency. For a given distance, how many peaks pass through? That's all I want. What is wavelength? What is frequency? So frequency is a given range. How many times does a peak hit? Okay. Wavelength is what is the distance literally between those peaks. Okay. That's the important distinction to get out of this. Right, at this stage. If you have to move into 151, they will yin-yang you up all over the place on calculations. Let them do that. I don't want to. Okay. The next part is where do we see light? Okay. Well, light is part of what's known as the electromagnetic spectrum, okay, or the radiant energy spectrum. So there's our pretty light, a rainbow. Okay. That rainbow is continuous, meaning when I change the wavelength by a single unit, I'm at a new color. If I change it by a fraction of a unit, it becomes a new color. Okay. Everywhere on that line is a new color. Okay. So all colors are in there. All of them are described. There is no black space, if you will, within the visible spectrum. Okay. It's continuous. Okay. That tiny little section, so everything that we can see makes up a very tiny section of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Okay? And all it is is energy. So when we're looking at the world and seeing colors, really what's happening is energy is punching us in the eyeball. Our eyeball responds and says, that was blue. That hurt, stop it. And then you hit it with red. And it's like, yeah, that's OK. okay? Why is it OK with red, but not so OK with blue? Okay. We could do something about frequency. That's a possibility. Higher energy. Energy is probably the part that you're going to be more concerned about. Okay. A little two-year-old comes up and punches you, you probably think it's cute. If London comes up and punches you, you probably won't think it's as cute. Presumably. <laughs> I might guess. Okay. So there's a significant difference there, and that's really coming down to the energy. Yes, that can be tied back to the wavelength and frequency. Okay. So red was lower in energy than the blue, according to what I just described. Okay. Well, how would you know that? Wavelength. Okay. You could look at wavelength. It's a possibility. Ultimately, it's just a memorization. You just have to have that tied somehow in your brain. Well, how could you tie that into your brain? When you step outside into the sunlight, in Arizona, we do freak out a little bit about the sun. Why? It's 
it's hot. So that's all you're concerned. Well, you actually you know, might be only concerned about the heat. I'm not, I'm not but your partner right heat. next to you can help us out. You're a lot more afraid of the heat and the sun. Why? Because I get sunburned. That shit you get sunburned. Okay, so it's not just heat. It's the heat that causes the sunburn. If that was the case, then why aren't we all cooking? Why are you extra vulnerable to this? And it's not just the heat. It's the ultraviolet light coming from the sun. Ultra what? Violet. Violet. Which is closer to blue, violet or red? Violet. Violet. Which one's higher in energy? Violet. Violet, because of that stupid, pesky, ultraviolet light that we encounter when we hit the sun. Okay? The sun is also giving off heat. That's our infrared. Okay? Yes, heat can be dangerous, okay? but the ultraviolet light is higher in energy and can cause all sorts of nasty things to happen to us unless we have some protection on, okay? like sunscreen, okay? that absorbs that high energy particle instead of our skin. Okay? So if you always have a hard time memorizing which color has the highest energy, tie it back to what you already know. The sun hurts because of ultraviolet light. That ultraviolet light means violet is higher in energy. Okay, well, then that means violet is the highest energy. I need to know the opposite end of that. Okay, well, that means I would need to know all the colors of the rainbow. So what colors are in that rainbow? Okay. So we've heard Roy G. Biv pop out. Remember, all of the colors are in the rainbow. Why do we only go through with Roy G. Biv? Those are like the main colors. Those are the easiest blocked out colors that we can evaluate. So we as humans say, that's crap. I don't want to memorize all of that. So I'm just going to memorize small sections. I'm going to say I have red. Uh, do I have orange? Yeah. I do have orange. There's orange. No, on my thing. You can't see that. You will tell me what I have on my screen. No. <laughs> red, orange, yellow. That's still yellow. Let's try that again. Green. I never really knew what indigo was. I always thought it was kind of purpley. But indigo is something in here. Whoops, no, crap, that one's blue. Let's just say that's blue. Indigo-y. And violet. So I heard Ashton going through and it was V, I, B, and then someone else in the back just saying it's Roy G. Biv. Roy G. Biv is just the way we memorize it because it's easier to memorize it as kind of a name. It's Roy with the middle name of G and his last name is Biv. I don't know, but whatever works, you now have the light sequence or the color sequence memorized. With the color sequence memorized and the fact that the sun hurts, you now know your energies. Violet is the highest energy. Red is now the lowest. Everything in between scaffolds off of that. What's that? Uh, so you had a question on one of your practice exams. I saw. Mm -hmm. I was trying to figure it, and it was red. Well, it was the least amount of energy. Red is the least amount of energy. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. There's other parts of our electromagnetic spectrum: radio waves, TV, microwave, infrared, ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays, cosmic rays. Okay. Notice as we move further up this way, we start to enter like the cool ones, like gamma rays. Okay. You don't get turned into Hulk, you turn into a mush. Okay? That's kind of the opposite. Okay? Same deal if we hit up in the cosmic rays range. That is now so high energy, it pretty much just destroys us. Okay? If we move the other direction, those parts of the electromagnetic spectrum are now so low in energy that they don't really have any effect on us. Okay? Which is why we can use it for doing TV or radio. Because if that had a massive effect on us, what happens to us? We die. Yeah. Okay. Or we wouldn't have invented technology to use these things as you know, ma means of mass communication. Okay. So that's kind of our big aspect out of this, which has our higher energy. Nail down the visible color spectrum. Future classes might actually have you nail down the electromagnetic spectrum, the entire one. I care less about that. Why has this then become important? 
Okay, well, that's where we encounter with our electrons. And what we get is our emission line spectrum. Okay, and this gets a bit bizarre. Okay, when we discovered electricity, we had a lot of fun with it. And okay, we noticed that it hurt when it zapped us. And we noticed that we could make it do things. Okay, or we can make other people do things. We get a little cattle prod and we poke people and they do things for us. Okay? Generally not the nicest thing to do. Okay? But we decided, well, if we could make people do things with this, maybe we can make inanimate objects do things with this as well. Okay? So we started to take chambers and expose them to electricity and said, what happens when we do this? Okay? So we took a chamber okay, and we decided to do it to a gas. So why not? Let's just do it to a gas. The problem with doing it to a gas is that we have to make sure it's very small amounts of gas, okay, and it's very clean. So we need a vacuum. Empty the chamber out and then partially fill it with our gas. Okay, so we put hydrogen back into this tube, and then we stuck a cattle prod to it with 20,000 volts and said, do my laundry. Okay, well, instead of doing laundry, it started to glow. Right? And the chamber glowed this weird purple color. I'm like, oh, that's kind of neat. I wonder what that purple color looks like when it hits a prism. Because we've seen normal white light or sunlight hit prisms and give us that nice, beautiful spectrum of the rainbow. Okay, so we're like, well, now we're seeing a purple color. I wonder what that looks like when I hit it through a prism. And we hit it through the prism, and what might we expect to see? Right? Well, we might expect just a bunch of purple light at the end of it. And instead what we saw was not this continuous band of purple. What we saw was three lines. Yes, we saw a purple one, but we also saw a green and we also saw a red. Okay. And again, not bands, very narrow lines. Well, that's kind of weird. I'm punching a bunch of electricity into this molecule we're into these atoms. So presumably something is happening with the electrons. The electrons that I said could exist anywhere. And those electrons are only responding with very particular energies. What does that conclusion mean? My assumption is that my electrons can exist anywhere around the atom. <coughs> they should be lowest in energy, closest to the nucleus, because What does the nucleus have? Protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons. It has positive charge. What does that positive charge do to the electron? Okay. They attract opposite charges, so they neutralize. Chemistry is about neutralizing. So the closer it is to the nucleus, the more lower energy it is. The further the electron is from the nucleus, the higher the energy is, because it's now not as close to the positive charge to cancel out. If I say the electron can exist anywhere around, that means I have an infinite amount of energy states. It can be 0.1 centimeters from the nucleus. It can be 0.111 centimeters. It can be 0.100001 centimeters, which means I have an infinite amount of energies, which means I would have a continuous spectrum of energies coming out of my emission spectrum. But I don't have that. What does that then necessitate? that means is the electrons can now only exist at defined levels. The electron's not allowed to exist anywhere around the nucleus. It has to be at this spot, or this spot, or this spot, or this spot. And that can explain the line spectrum. Because what's happening is the electron is now saying, whoa, I'm at a way high energy. I don't want to be up here. And it jumps back down. So that means it had to lose energy it lost that energy as visible light. And that's what we're seeing. Okay? It is that loss of energy that contributes to this. And because there's only distinct energy levels that we can exist at, we see lines for our elements. Okay? That is huge. We've gone from the plum pudding model, where things are just everywhere, to now a nucleus saying, Protons and neutrons have to be in the nucleus. See the electrons now being everywhere. And now we're saying electrons, nope, you can't be everywhere. You have to be at these defined locations. Right? That's pretty huge. Right? This was Bohr. Niels Bohr was the one that came up with this theory. And he said, we have these distinct energy levels. He called them orbits. 
right? Because they're kind of like revolving around a star. It's almost celestial. Right? And what he's using to explain this is that if we take a look at that hydrogen, it has one electron. That one electron is likely going to be at the lowest energy state for hydrogen. It's going to be happy, just chilling there. Okay? Just like you are chilling at your lowest energy state, which is sitting down right now. Okay? Some of you, I'm sure, would be more than happy to lie down. That's theoretically not allowed, but I don't care. Okay? But nobody's standing, because that's a higher energy state. Okay? So what happens when we pump 20,000 volts into it? What happens if the person with the buzzer underneath their seat gets a little bit of a jolt? That would have been funny, but I didn't do that. No one even looked like, really? Okay. If we put 20,000 volts behind one of your seats, what's going to happen? You're going to jump up. What's going to happen to this electron when it gets 20,000 volts? It's going to jump. Okay. Where can it jump? Well, according to Bohr, it can only jump to the next level or higher levels, but it can't jump in between. Okay. So let's say we hit it with 20,000 volts. It now jumps up to that level. Okay. You're now standing. I turn off the voltage. You're probably going to punch me. Okay. <laughs> Trade chairs. Okay. But then you're probably going to be like, okay, it's time back for lecture. I'm going to sit back down. Okay. Well, what is this electron going to do? It's going to sit back down. We gave it energy through the electricity to jump. Now that it's said, okay, fine, you got me. That's cool. I'll accept it. I'll sit back down. That energy has to be gone, released somehow. So when it comes back down, that energy gets emitted as light, typically related as H nu. Don't stress about that. I shouldn't have written that. Let's just say energy or light, and let's just cross that out. Okay. That light is our red, our green, or our purple. It's equivalent to the energy gap between those orbitals. That's pretty phenomenal. We have a direct observation for electron orbitals existing. I talked too long. I apologize. We'll, 